uh, for joining to our 52 uh, meeting, uh, San Diego Sebas Meetup. Uh, we have a special guest. We'll get to it in a second. Uh, today is July 11th. Uh, my kids are actually uh, wandering around in the car, uh, getting some freebies from 7-Eleven. Uh, apparently, uh, this is a thing here in US. So, uh, so that's what they're doing right now. Um, so today we have a special guest uh, uh, speaking about modern CMake best practices uh, for library authors. Uh, Alex Ranking, thank you for uh, for the, uh, agreeing to talk here. I'm super yeah. excited to have you. Uh, yeah, cool. And and just uh, if you are if you any one of you is uh, is new to the uh, to the meetup, uh, we meet once a month uh, and just discuss uh, all kinds of topics in C++, uh, anything you can think of. Uh, uh, it's a mixture of uh, speakers just like we have today. Sometimes I'll be the one uh, providing sessions. And uh, if you would like to talk about anything, in C++ or in the domain of C++, including build systems and similar, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. I'll be more than happy to have you here in uh, in our meetup. Uh, the meetup is sponsored by Qualcomm Wireless uh, Research and Development Software. Uh, thanks, Charles uh, Bergan, for uh, uh, sponsoring the meetup fees. Uh, I used to be part of the wireless uh, software. I'm actually part of the uh, AI uh, Qualcomm AI Cloud, uh, uh, but I'm still I still have a lot of connection in in the research in the in the wireless research, so they they still sponsor the meetup. So thank you thank you for doing that. Uh, we have a Discord ask before a link. We have a Dropbox where I uh, place the uh, uh, all the content that we that we have here. I share it in in a Dropbox. Uh, if you can't if you cannot access it, just don't hesitate and contact me. I'll I'll get you the link. Uh, everything is uploaded to SDCPP Meetup YouTube channel. Uh, recent sessions are uploaded at least a couple of years back. I started uh, uh, recording uh, maybe two three years back actually. Um, we have a Twitter account. Uh, no threads. No master. Don't know anything. Like I'm I'm lazy. Uh, so it's SDCPP Meetup, and I have my own handle, which is Kobe underscore CA. Uh, I would sometimes have a blog post or two in uh, uh, Martin uh, Robert blog. Uh, there is a coroutine that I published last month or maybe six, seven weeks back, uh, kind of reflecting the the meetup session that we had beginning of the year. Uh, so again, uh, so that basically uh, the just the intro for the for the um, regular meetup sessions. Uh, we have Alex today. Uh, this is the abstract that you all have access to, but I, I would like to just go over his bio. So Alex is a research scientist as, uh, at Qualcomm Compiler Labs. So he's a, he's a peer of, of Qualcomm. Uh, that's, that's exciting. He got his PhD in programming languages uh, from UC Berkeley in 2022. Congrats, by the way. Uh, since 2022, so sorry, so since 2020, Alex has served as an open source maintainer for Helide. I don't know if I hey, pronounce right. it. Like, yeah. yeah, a popular DSL for optimizing image and tensor processing. Uh, in this capacity, he has overhauled the build system, CI infra, and the release process. He also co contributed build system improvement to uh, all kinds of open source projects, uh, including uh, Wabbit, which I have all kinds of links, so you can you can click on that. Tiny XML too, which a lot of people probably familiar with, and uh, the very famous CPP front. Uh, and also, he fixed a large CMake bugs, which is really, really cool. Uh, welcome, Alex. Okay, time to share here. Let's see. Okay, so. Okay. Cool, okay. Uh, so you already heard my, uh, my talk. So. Um, you know, for, for better or worse, uh, CMake right now is the market leader in uh, build system software for uh, for C and C++. Um, and you know, this is not necessarily something that everybody uh, likes or enjoys. Uh, CMake has sort of a reputation for being uh, pretty arcane 
and uh, just d generally uh, difficult to work with. Um, but uh, it's currently the most promising answer to uh, the C++ package management uh, issue, or rather uh, library consumption issue, basically because there's um, having everything in this one ecosystem uh, just makes everything uh, work more smoothly. DC packages is founded on the idea of using CMake as like the way of interchanging library information. Um, the new Conan 2.0 has switched to a much more VC package-like model, uh, but with like all the good binary support that it's always had. And basically, there's this ideal experience that is pretty rare out in the wild of how you would want to interact with a CMake project, right? If you're building a project, you just want to be able to set up the build type, the path to your dependencies, point to the source and build directories, build it and install it. And when you're consuming a project, you really don't want to do anything more than uh, find the package and link it to your app. Um, so what package managers actually do today is that they try to do that, right? They say, okay, we're going to download the sources and then build them and then install the binary to some local prefix and then go ahead and build your project. Uh, but what they actually do in practice, uh, because uh, most CMake builds are you know, terribly broken, is they download the sources and then they patch the build system. And then with that patched build system, they manage to build the sources. And then the binaries have problems because they have hard-coded data and then sometimes it's you know, not flexible or that they weren't able to uh, fix just by um, just by adjusting the build system. So now they've got to patch the binaries. They install the binaries to, to a local prefix, but using the normal installation uh, procedures from, from the way that the library wrote it doesn't, don't work out. So then they fix the installed layout and then they go and build your project. And that's great. VC package does all of this really well. It even goes to the point sometimes for some dependencies of outright providing a unique build system one that has nothing to do with the upstream one because the upstream one is just so broken. Um, but when users uh, go and try to do these steps, they, they do them slightly differently. So they'll patch the build system, but they'll do it wrong. And then you get, uh, and then you get bug reports that have nothing to do with the real problem. Uh, if they get to the point where they've built the sources and find that, that they need to patch the binary somehow, but at that point they just get frustrated. And even if they make it past them, with a broken install layout, they finally just give up and don't even get to the point of building their own project. They go and do something else or they reinvent the wheel. Uh, this is not a good state of affairs um, because this is the worst experience. And this is the one that I think if you've used CMake before, you're probably familiar with. You know, you don't just set the, the, the build type to release. You also have to set some weird project option to an undocumented uh, value. And then when you go to actually build the generated build system, you have to have your environment variables set up just so. And you know, when, when you finally go to install the project, you discover that, oh, you know, two steps ago when you configured it, you didn't realize that the, uh, that the CMake project had hard-coded the value of CMake install prefix somewhere. And so now it's installing to use your local instead of the prefix that you wanted. And then when you go to con consume a library like this, you have to set maybe a weird variable before find package that's tantamount to just foobar, please work, one, and then maybe they forget uh, a dependency. Now you have to like manually go and chase those down when you're uh, putting in uh, your, your, your call to target link libraries. So this is, the, this is a bad experience, but it's also a common one. My hope of this talk today is to sort of address uh, ways that we can uh, work around that. And so uh, to that end, I've uh, built a demo app um, the link is, is in the chat. Uh, I just call it Diffuse. I uh, shamelessly stole one of Halide's uh, application demos, uh, and I've attached it to two different um, two different targets. We're going to see how one re relatively simple build can enable you to uh, support both of these uh, situations without large amounts of you know domain knowledge of like, MScript and or Windows, even if you know you're gen generally working on x86 Linux. Um, so. We're going, to, we're going to be looking at building for uh, Linux with MScript and targeting WebAssembly and building in Windows with MSVC using a native SDL. So here's a layout of the project so we can kind of uh, understand what's there. Uh, there's this library called libdiffuse, which consists of a couple uh, headers, so diffuse.h and export.h. Export is there to control uh, symbol visibility. And then we have some source files, uh, the, the actual source for the library itself, plus this reaction diffusion generator we'll talk a little bit more about, and this is a halide thing. Um, 
And then finally, th this will feed down into an app that actually can uh, run the sort of rendering loop using SDL. So this will compile to both uh, native SDL and unscripted SDL. Um, and it consists of a main.cpp file that is what's really compiled there and depends on libdiffuse, and then an index.html file for, um, it's, which is very small just to load the, the generated WebAssembly. Um, and so libdiffuse then directly depends on threads because the, diffu because the diffusion uh, calculation will be multi-threaded. Um, and the, it also depends on the Halite compiler at build time and it depends on Halite runtime components when it's built as a static library, because some of those runtime components are static libraries too. And then Diffuse uh, SDL, the, the, the running project, depends on SDL. Uh, note that there's an interesting build requirement for libdiffuse, which is that the, the Halite generators have to run on the host machine. So when we're compiling, compiling for WebAssembly to, to, uh, to, to um, get the unscripted build uh, launched, this generator is going to have to be built ahead of time for and on the host machine in order to be called during the cross-compiling build. So we're going to see how that works too. So before you can even start writing CMake code at all, you have to pick a CMake version. And uh, I'm just going to tell you to use the latest one. Um, CMake is ridiculously backwards compatible. It's not forwards compatible at all. Uh, it's constantly improving and it has a lot of room for improvement. So you want to have a pretty uh, brisk up, upgrade phase. Um, uh, Constantinos, could you could you mute? I'm hearing like a lot of breathing. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, and so uh, the reason you want to use a, a recent version of CMake is because if you just put CMake minimum required some earlier version up there. Uh, there is absolutely no guarantee that it will work with with that version. If you if you go ahead and are writing C plus plus seventeen code, but you put CMake minimum required three point two up top, well, first of all, CMake three point two predates C plus plus seventeen, so that's not gonna <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Uh, it's not gonna know how to con um, it's not going to know how to configure any compiler that is capable of compiling your code. So you're you're essentially in a contradiction here. Uh, and that's, and that's the, the distinction between backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility. If you have authored and tested a CMake build on 3.2, then 3.26, the latest version, will, will be able to run it. However, if you use 3.26 to author an older version, well, there's nothing stopping you from using features that are too new for that version. There's nothing stopping you from essentially writing something, something completely bogus from the older version's perspective. So use the latest CMake, and if you don't, then that you must at least test with the stated minimum version. Cool. So right up to here, this is the code that we're going to use to build uh, to build our project. CMake minimum required version 3.26. I keep up to date. Um, the project's name is Diffuse, and we're on uh, like the earliest Semver uh, 010. Now we're going to need to find some dependencies, and I would like to argue that find pack the, the basic signature for um, for finding uh, for the find package command is the one true way uh, to locate a dependency. It'll be find package foobar. Uh, maybe you supply a version if, in case you have particular version requirements on that. As of more recent uh, CMake versions, you can actually supply a version range. So you can say, you know, uh, I, I will in this library, but it has to be between versions, you know, 1.3 and 1.5 because 1.6 thinks there's a bug or some ABI breaking change happened or something along those lines. And then you can also optionally um, specify required components. So if you're importing Qt or something and you need the GUI and database libraries, um, specify those there, that, that's fine. Because uh, anything else that you do that might uh, change the uh, arguments to define package are either going to hard code some assumptions. So those are like the hints or tabs uh, arguments that put you into config mode and add um, guesses as to where the package might be almost certainly that should be set externally. Um, and the reason you would use find package in favor of add subdirectory or fetch content is because those options um, allow upstream projects to basically run arbitrary code in, in your uh, environment. And I have yet to see a CMake build that I didn't write that's hygienic enough to do that. And there's a, okay, I'm being a little, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, I, I, can, I can think of like, a handful of projects, maybe, that 
can be consumed that way without something going wrong, without injecting flags, without uh, so without it breaking some tool chain for you somewhere. Uh, TMake does not do much in the way of project isolation. And so using that as your hard-coded dependency resolution strategy is, is not a great idea. Uh, and so the, the, last, uh, the last one is a little bit arcane, but when you use the basic version of the find package command, uh, it will actually look for a module named find whatever, like find foobar first. And if you have a, a particularly badly behaved dependency or one that is commonly patched by a Linux distribution maintainers, um, ha allowing the maintainer to write a find module that sort of conforms to that interface for you is, is a good hook because they can avoid patching your build. They can just write more code, which is always the way that you want uh, people to interact with you in, in uh, pull requests or rather issue, uh, issues open. We, we, we on the Halide team have um, gotten rather a few years ago, we would get uh, bug reports from people who were using a patched version of our build. So this is kind of what made me discover VC package in the first place, was there were uh, there were bugs in, in our build that went unaddressed. VC package opted to um, just patch our build and not tell us, and then we were getting reports from people who were using some code that we had never seen before as if we wrote it. Uh, so yeah, it, it's best to make your build not need to be patched. That's kind of the ultimate condemnation of that type of code, in, in, in my opinion, is that there was really no other way to get the right thing done except by changing your code. So let, we, we want to avoid that. So what we need uh, for this project is the Halide buffers. So we're just going to find, uh, we're going to uh, run find package for that, call it, um, and then it's required because you can't build without it. So, uh, I don't want to uh, deep dive too much into how Halide works, but because it's a code generator, there that has to run on the host. It has some interesting uh, build requirements surrounding it. So, Halide generators are C++ are just normal C++ programs that do the following three steps. So, they build up a chunk of Halide IR, which is you know some bit of uh, Halide language code. It's sort of using like expression templates and an operator overloading in C++ to achieve a kind of natural syntax, but that's really what it's doing, is you're, you're building a chunk of IR. That gets passed to libhalide, which is the compiler library, and then it will spit out a static library for whatever target you ask for. And so this has to happen during the build. And so the generator binaries have to run on the host system, and then the static libraries that they output are linked to your final, uh, to your final library, to your final application, or, or whatever. Uh, here, the Halide helpers uh, package provides this, this function called add Halide generator that takes a, a list of sources and the target name and gives you uh, back a, a generator that is set up for cross compilation and for um, and, and has all of the, the properties set correctly. Um, our particular generator uh, has three different functions for uh, initializing, updating, and rendering uh, the um, that sort of uh, diffusion reaction uh, simulation that you saw in the picture earlier. And those are the things that are going to get linked into our real application. Um, again, there's no real need to dwell on this because it's fairly declarative. We're just saying, ask the generator to produce these three, um, these three pipelines, these three static libraries that are going to get linked in, in a moment. Uh, I think I kind of already uh, talked about this, uh, but because of the issues with, with fetch content, um, if you want your project to be consumable via fetch content, uh, you have to do some more legwork. Um, and it is undeniably popular. People will ask you to, to support this. Uh, but I, I just want to take a moment to, assure, to reassure you that if you don't want to, um, to do everything that you must to have robust fetch, fetch content support, uh, you should just tell your users in a programmatic way that they're doing the wrong thing. So if not, project is top level, fatal error, we don't support fetch content. That is absolutely an acceptable solution because at the very least it causes no surprises. You don't just um, get imported into somebody else and then your code runs and it messes something up for them and they at least start uh, complaining in your issue tracker. Uh, much better to just be like, have, much better to just point them to some pre-existing feature request issue uh, and save yourself some headaches. So, uh, we aim to support both uh, static and uh, shared library types for, for libdiffuse. 
Uh, and because we are choosing to be uh, nice to fetch content users, uh, we're going to need to manually namespace our targets to avoid uh, collisions with other targets that unknowable downstreams might uh, might try to integrate. Uh, maybe just naming our library diffuse might uh, you know conflict with something else that they're trying to use it in. Um, and also shared libraries require subversion. So the, the code for doing this properly looks like this. Um, we start by adding a library with no specified type uh, called diffuse underscore diffuse. Um, using that underscore gives a namespace at the CMake, uh, at least at the CMake build level. And then we create an alias with the, with the, with the double colons that just resolves the other one. This is weird. <laughs> this is definitely a pain point in CMake. Uh, when you all, when we ultimately go and create the CMake package, the imported target is going to have the name diffuse colon colon diffuse. But because of Windows path naming restrictions, you cannot name a target that will be in the generated system and then that contains a colon. And so you need to have this alias dance in the build system. So from the like fetch content and add subdirectory users perspectives, they can use diffuse colon colon diffuse just the same as a, uh, as a fine package people can, uh, but there needs to be this level of indirection because of weird legacy uh, scenic things. Uh, this is sort of yet another reason to enlarge content users. Uh, and because uh, the target name is used to compute the uh, names of the exported target and the actual library on disk, we end up setting those properties uh, to be normal diffuse in, in both cases so that you get like libdiffuse.so on disk instead of libdiffuse underscore diffuse.so, which would be weird. Um, and then we set the version and so version to match the um, actual project version. So, uh, you know, you'd be right to ask uh, why not use two targets? It's because this is actually a very common solution to the uh, dual static and shared approach. Uh, I actually really object to this because uh, there's, there's a good number of problems. Uh, nobody actually wants both. Uh, there's a sort of golden rule of library, <laughs> of um, CMake library authorship, where you know don't do to your downstreams what you don't want from your upstreams. Uh, and nobody wants to build both. You know, if, if when you first of all, you can't link both the static and shared copy of a library into the same application. That's just never going to happen. The, the people who want both are package distributors and those who want an ability to switch between them programmatically, but you never are actually using both at the same time. So it's weird to compile both. And then you have to, and then the, it will also double the length of time that it takes for your, uh, for your project to build because you can't share those, um, you can't share the object files between them because of uh, position, independ uh, position independent code issues. The static uh, objects should probably be built without PIC enabled unless the plan is to stuff them into a shared library somewhere. Um, but that's not always the case, especially in, in uh, embedded settings. So it's not something you should hard code either. Um, and then when the link type is hard, and then it also forces your downstreams to make a decision in the target name about which one they're going to use, which makes it impossible for packagers to override it and impossible to, um, to resolve diamond dependencies that arise where uh, your, you know, some downstream project depends on library A and B that both depend on C, but library A wanted the shared version of C and library B, B wanted the static version of C. So don't use two targets, use one and switch between them and we'll see uh, kind of how that, that shakes out. So now uh, we just need to attach the, our, our source files uh, to libdiffuse. Um, so there's this new, very new CMake feature called file sets that that's great. It allows you to uh, list private sources separately from like API headers, um, and it makes specifying install rules and uh, include paths much simpler and, and declarative. Um, I also just want to take one moment to mention: please don't blab for sources. If I have to update your, if if I have to manually reconfigure CMake, uh, I'm going to be sad. <laughs> it, it is very very unexpected. The the con the contract that CMake promises to its users is that it generates a build system that is at that point self-contained. So once I've generated the build system, unless I want to change the build settings, I should just be able to run the tool, meaning make or ninja or MS build or whatever. Uh, globbing for sources breaks that and configure depends does not work everywhere. So uh, please don't do that. I know listing uh, sources 
manually is a little bit painful the first time. But once a project becomes mature enough, you are very rarely touching those lists. So, yeah, uh, I, I understand this is a little bit of a holy war uh, for some people, but that, that's, that's my, my opinion. Um, so this is what that looks like. Uh, we attach the C++ uh, source file to the private sources of, of our diffuse library. And then we uh, create um, a file set for the, uh, for the headers. Uh, so there's two base directories, um, the normal include, and then also this generated includes directory that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. I list out the, the existing uh, diffuse and export.h uh, headers. Um, and then there's also this kind of, uh, there, there's also a, this kind of uh, confusing uh, export uh, type um, file that's generated here. And I'm going to explain to you a CMake bug that still exists. <laughs> Um, well, it's either a bug or maybe uh, a potential area for design improvement, um, but I'll uh, take that little detour now. So there's a very popular CMake module built in called Generate Export Header, and its uh, reason for being is to write headers with these API export macros in them. Uh, these are used to control uh, symbol visibility in shared libraries, and, and it's very important if you uh, care about ABI stability. Uh, which I realize not a lot of projects do, but for those that do, it's important to have portable uh, export macros. However, the way it's designed, it only works for a single library type. So when you use the uh, the code that's suggested by the documentation, which is what's on the slide here, uh, you you get a header, an export header that only works for, say, shared libraries or for static libraries, depending on how Diffuse is, is configured. And so that's no good. Um, so my workaround for this uh, is to have the on disk uh, export header pick between the static and shared versions depending on uh, a, a define. And uh, so in the build system, then I end up writing, you know, well, if we're building shared libs, I'm going to set this type variable to shared. Otherwise, I'm going to set this type variable to static. And now I'm going to attach that static define to my uh, diffuse target, and I'm going to make it public. And if you're not familiar with what public means in, in uh, CMake, it means that downstreams of the diffuse target are going to see that um, that that uh, dash D flag, that compiler definition. And when they build, they'll build your headers, or rather, they'll include your headers with that defined step, um, even after packaging. So that's very cool and and a very declarative way of specifying this build requirement. So then we go and use basically the same code, only we put the type in the name. So it's include diffuse export share.h or export static.h. And then the, the sort of redirecting header uh, picks the right one. Um, I really wish it weren't like this. I have an open, uh, I have an open GitLab issue with CMake about uh, either changing this via policy or um, adding like a different mode to the generate export header uh, command that allows for um, basically dual usage. But uh, yeah, <laughs> this is definitely still a pain point, but it's something to be aware of. If, you know, if, um, if packaging uh, dually uh, shared and static libraries is something that's important to you. So um, we're almost done with the libdiffuse build. We just need to attach the dependencies. Uh, so this is very straightforward with, with target link libraries. We uh, asked Halide to build three, uh, three high performance libraries for us. So we're going to link them here. That, that's all we're doing. We link reaction diffuse init, update, and render. So um, I want to take a moment before we write the packaging code for this to uh, talk about what is not in this build. Uh, so here is what is in this build. The correct list of sources and dependencies. Uh, you know, potentially you could have checks for symbols to determine if a sanitizer is enabled, uh, or checks for headers if you have uh, like handwritten uh, code that uses intrinsics, you know. You might check for the presence of imintrin to decide whether or not to build the x86 optimized portion of your code base. Uh, but things that I really don't believe belong in a CMake lists.txt file are things like wall, wextra, werror, warning flags, uh, the choice of linker if you want to use mold or something uh, much faster. Uh, like that's not a hard build requirement. Uh, Attaching a sanitizer is also not really something that belongs in your uh, cmakelist.txt because the way that I conceptualize uh, these cmakelist.txt is that they're telling, they're, they're there to communicate 
exactly what must be done to build your code base. Everything else is the user's decision. And the reason it must be the user's decision is because of combinatorial explosion. If your code is truly portable, then there are, you know, there's at least three major compiler vendors. So you've got GCC, you've got Clang, you've got MSVC. There's at least four actively used versions of each one of those. Uh, GCC, like nine through 12, Clang, you know, lots of MSVC versions, even ones going back kind of too long. Um, countless compiler variants, you know, uh, CMake will uh, report Clang CLs being the same as Clang, even though if they don't accept the same set of arguments. Uh, company maintained forks of any of these compilers. There's countless target variations. You know, you might have one that's set up for x86 or ARM, uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, the idea that you can maintain uh, a, a valid list of like compiler compatibility flag, flag compatibility tables is almost as absurd as the idea of wanting to do it in the first place, because these things stack multiplicatively. Suddenly, you're asking questions about Oh, which compiler versions support W suggest override again? Or in particular, like W no suggest override if you want to disable that check, because on GCC5 it was kind of slow. <laughs> these are these are the types of questions that you don't want to get into. And the and the, and the solution that uh, CMake has had now since 3.19 is uh, is presets. I, I, we really don't have time today to go a like, deep dive in, into presets, but the basic idea is that you um, you write this JSON file that contains like the, the configuration settings for a set of known points in this combinatorial space of, of, uh, of configuration uh, options. So you might define a, a preset called like GCC Linux x x that sets the C flags to be you know W all W extra uh, MR Chaswell and FU LD mold because you want fast linking. You know that you're going to support least Chaswell for like AVX two and uh, you want and you care a lot about warnings. Uh, and then for um, you know CXX flags release, you might say, well, when, when we're doing a release build, we want fast math, but we know that our, our code won't work right if you uh, assume that, you're, that all math is finite. So we disable that one too. So this is a this is a place where you know fast math is not a hard build requirement. Your code will build without fast math, <laughs> um, just like it will build without optimization settings. And they call CMIC calls these things uh, configs, configuration options for a reason. You know, the release config is one point in like this configuration subspace of what it is you want to do. You're producing release binaries as opposed to debug binaries, or as opposed to minimum size release or release with debug information, which are the four default uh, CMA configuration uh, options. Uh, and then lastly, you might set this uh, very new um, Option to CMake called CMake compile warning as error, which is a bool that will automatically apply W error when it's when it's on, but it can be overridden. And so if you uh, if you set this in a preset or God forbid you hard code it, uh, it can actually be uh, disabled at the CMake command line. You can tell CMake to ignore that feature completely. So that, for instance, if you are trying to build some slightly bit rotted code base for a newer version, uh, you know of Ubuntu or whatever. And you know your much newer compiler detects some problems with the code that the older compiler that it passed all of its W error settings on uh, didn't detect. Now, at the very least, you can you can make progress without um, without having to patch that build. So back to uh, back to packaging. Uh, for for the sake of fetch content, again, we're going to make it possible to disable our packaging rules very often downstream to integrate upstream uh, dependencies in this way want to package things themselves. Oh, uh, there's a question in the chat. The presets, uh, Jason resides uh, at the top level next to the top level teaming of this dot text. Uh, I, I left a link uh, here to the manual um, in, in the CMake documentation. Um, so we're going to create basically a, a new uh, directory just for the purpose of housing a uh, CMake list uh, text file to hold our, our packaging rules. And I'll just like very quickly cover the snippet conditionally including it before we dive into like, how the packaging actually works. So we're going to add this dependent option that uh, checks to see whether or not the CMake skip install rules uh, option is on. Because if it is on, you really don't want to call the install command. Because first of all, CMake will ignore it. But second of all, CMake will uh, spray out like hundreds of lines worth of warnings. Um, this is something that I also have uh, an open uh, GitLab issue with them about, is, is trying to make this feature less noisy. 
Uh, but at the very least, uh, I do think there should be a check to see if uh, skip install rules is on so you avoid calling install command when, when that's the case. Um, and so we provide this sort of uh, project level option to fuse skip install rules, which is off by default. Uh, and only if it's ultimately on, like somebody has asked to skip it, do we uh, not include this package in some directory. So hopefully this, this little snippet is, is straightforward with the you know sort of arcane note about this skip install rules feature that some people actually do use. Um, so there are two uh, standard CMIC modules that every uh, package uh, will basically that every bit of packaging code will have to include. So there's GNU installers, which uh, despite the name is um, a broad abstraction uh, over like Mac, Windows, and and Linux uh, install layouts, and it sets up the default directories for you for install commands as of like 3.16 or something. Maybe it was 3.14 they started doing this. Um, and then there's the CMake package config callers that we'll see in a minute. So uh, the first thing to do is actually install uh, the the fuse uh, target because that's our library. That's what ultimately needs to get um, that's what ultimately needs to get delivered to our to our end users. Um, but we want to give each part, each potential part of this, uh, a component. And a component is something that uh, CPAC and in fact command line users can use to install only a like meaningful subset of your project. So for instance, you would want components for the like the runtime parts of your libraries, which might be the you know the SO files as opposed to the uh, like the headers, which would reside in a development component. And this is sort of if you've ever used a Linux package manager, this is something you've seen before. Right? You'll have like libjpeg, but then you'll also have libjpeg dash dev. And when you provide components like this to your downstreams, somebody wanting to package your uh, code base for say Debian only has to use uh, your your install rules, and you've saved them a lot of time. Uh, you're going to find that package ma maintainers want to package your, uh, or rather, they are happy when they're packaging your um, your code. So don't forget the, the components for all of these things. There's definitely an open issue somewhere in uh, GitLab about making uh, these what, the defaults using the project name as a, as a convention. So ideally, we could get all the way down to just install targets, whatever. Um, notice uh, two things in here. Uh, the file set headers component will automatically install only the public headers. So if you had a private uh, like a file set for, for headers, those would not be installed here, which is exactly the behavior you would want. And it will update the um, the include paths to the corresponding basters uh, according to this uh, this install target. So uh, you've all, this already handles everything that you would worry about um, with like making sure that there's that the installed version of your target uh, points to the right directories for the include flags. Um, this was something that you might see something along the lines of like you know this uh, generator expression like build interface and then like includes destination. All of that has been superseded uh, by this file set stuff. Um, so it, so you don't need to do both. Uh, it, it can appear harmless, but you can also end up doing weird things when when you have multiple when you have the include uh, path appear multiple times in, in the list. So you just avoid doing that. Um, and then the other thing to point out here is, is this export set. So when you install some targets, you add them to an export set. In this case, this is installed with these targets. Uh, and then later, we can install that export set and it will generate a chunk of CMake code for us that our downstreams can import and then understand uh, basically all the properties of our, um, of our installed targets. So uh, there is one little uh, thing here, which is that the um, we, we have to sort of specialize this again to whether or not we're building a shared or static because they're named the same. Um, we're ultimately going to provide our users with a way of picking between them, uh, but that does mean that we need two separate exports, one for the statics and one for the shares. And uh, because CMake doesn't bundle uh, static libraries, the four static libraries that were generated by, by Halide have to be included in the export set too. So that just gets uh, added here. If you're wondering how to figure that out, uh, try running CMake without it, <laughs> we'll tell you. <laughs> um, the error message contains a list of missing missing targets and that's just how you would determine this uh, in practice. You know, you, you would try to run your your, um, your install uh, set and it would fail at the figure time saying, 
you know, you tried to export diffuse diffuse, but it's missing reaction diffusion in the update render and the runtime. So just uh, add those in for, for this particular configuration. It's not necessary for the uh, shared version because the static libraries sort of disappear at the shared library boundary. Cool. So uh, after that, we uh, define a we, we define a cache variable for the location of our um, of our uh, generated CMake files. Uh, the reason that you do this rather than um, just putting you know CMake install linter slash CMake slash diffuse in the destination argument below directly uh, is because that won't work for everyone. Because Ubuntu and Debian will want to uh, put your uh, CMake config files into some other into some other place that has like the target triple somewhere in the path, and that won't necessarily and that won't necessarily work for the libraries. Um, someone might want to put your um, someone someone might want to put your uh, CMake files in a different location. For instance, VC package tries to put them all in the same place. Uh, so th this is one of these cases where nothing that is user configurable should have any hard-coded component to it and the destination argument now no longer does the user can override uh, diffuse install cmaker wholesale and then that becomes the destination argument to install full level um, so yeah avoid avoid giving any destination argument that isn't just directly expanding a cache variable uh, those should all be user configurable um, so there's again not, not a whole lot going on here. We are exporting either the shared or static targets, depending on how uh, this how we're being built this time. Um, and then we have to get a namespace. So that's diffuse colon colon. So if you remember export name from a million years ago uh, in the diffuse diffuse target spec, when it gets exported, it's going to have just the name diffuse. This namespace argument is going to add the diffuse colon colon back to it, as opposed to having uh, and so that brings it into accordance with the alias that we set up earlier. This is also needlessly confusing. Um, there is, there are proposals in the uh, like CMake um, issue tracker again to try to try to make this a little bit uh, more comprehensible. But um, this is just yet another reason to keep CMake up to date. You know, every time you upgrade CMake, you're going to find that you're able to chop off uh, lots of uh, code that is less than declarative. Uh, from your build, especially if your project is like um, And then naturally, all the CMake files go to in the build. Cool. So we're almost done. Uh, we just need to use these two helpers to generate the uh, package config file and the package version file. Um, the version uh, is computed from the project version, so that's 010. And because it's Semver, uh, major version 0 is exact version compatibility. You can also have the same major version, so that's once you're at 1.0 and beyond or uh, same minor version if you're maintaining an older project that uses those, those semantics. So like LLVM is, a, is an example of a same minor version type of compatibility. Uh, and uh, yeah, so then we just install uh, those particular files to the, to the CMake uh, directory and put them in the develop component. Uh, a word about the, the naming here, uh, diffuse-config and diffuse-config-version are the, um, are, Special, specially named files that find package understands. So these are the things that uh, basically find package hook latches onto when it when you uh, ask it to find something. So when it as soon as it finds diffuse config, it's going to look for this diffuse config version file and it's going to run the config version file in order to determine whether or not the version constraint is met before running your config file. So you don't need to manually write version checks or anything with, with these helpers. So this is this is why you go through this process rather than trying to try and write this stuff yourself. So you might ask, uh, what is in this uh, diffuse config file? Um, and if you don't want to support switching between static and shared libraries, you don't actually need it. You can just set the export uh, set to diffuse config and use that as your config file. Um, but in the example project, it implements a policy for picking which of the static or shared targets to load. Uh, in, the, in the repository, it's a good bit more complicated and, and it's based on this blog post I wrote a few years ago uh, titled Building a Dual Shared and Static Library of CMA. Um, it checks the, the requested components uh, for, one, for exactly one of uh, shared or static as a way of you know, hard coding it for um, downstreams that might actually have that as a requirement. For instance, if they're going to DL load it, you can't uh, find the static version that that just won't work. 
Um, and then it also allows, and then it also implements a check for like a special variable that uh, can be set on a per project basis. Um, but I'm just going to present a very simplified version of this, uh, where inside of this uh, package configuration file, there's this bit of boilerplate at the top. You know, you set the minimum uh, required version, and then you have this uh, app package init. This is what gives CMakes, uh, you know, a configure uh, package uh, helper, this uh, yeah configure package config file helper, a, a chance to inject some boilerplate code for you. So again, very helpful. Thank you, CMake. Uh, and then I, I've defined this uh, macro uh, kind of namespace to our uh, package that's just called load. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, look for the, the diffuse like shared targets or the diffuse static targets file, and if it exists. Uh, include it and this additional dependencies uh, file. And if it finds it, um, you know, it'll set loaded to one and then it won't uh, and then it won't complain back to the user uh, about uh, not being able to find it. So if all of the arguments to this are, are not found, then it says, ah, something went wrong, uh, sets diffuse found to zero, and it sets diffuse not found message to, uh, to a, a helpful response. Um, but actually, here's another CMake quirk. Uh, on on uh, operating systems that have case insensitive file systems like Windows, um, it will find and load your package with whatever the actual uh, name that was used was. So if somebody writes find package all caps diffuse, that will fail on Linux, but it can succeed on Windows. And then the um, the find package interface wants you to use the the same. Uh, name as was used in the request when issuing a response of found or not found. So you have to expand this CMake find package name, which is the name that was used to find the current package. Uh, this is more correct than just diffuse. Um, this is another case where I think it's acceptable to fatal error if those are not the same. Like at the start of your file, you say if CMake find package, if not CMake find package name, stir equal in double quotes diffuse, then fatal error. This package does not support uh, doing that. Or rather, if, if you do that, it was, it's probably more polite to just say found zero and, set it, and say the not found message is uh, basically like, you know, this, this is not a supported way of loading this package. Because that, that would at least give, um, that would at least give the downstreams a way of disambiguating between, you know, your lowercase diffuse package and somebody else's horribly uppercase diffuse. It's a bit of an edge case, but I think it's, it's probably more polite to just say not found rather than um, rather than fatally erroring anyway. Um, so then uh, the, the simple heuristic that we're going to use uh, to mirror uh, the fetch content and find package conventions is that if build shared uh, libs is set to true, we're going to try to load the shared libraries first. So if they're both available, um, we just basically use build shared libs to check. Uh, because in the find package case, right, when, sorry, in the fetch content case, when they're actually loading our build into theirs, the value of build shared libs that's set for them is going to govern what, uh, how diffuse is built. And so it should kind of, that should continue to, that should kind of continue to be um, presented so that, so that users can switch between the two uh, approaches uh, seamlessly. So that's all that's happening here. Um, and then there's, there's this one last thing about uh, transitive dependencies, um, where you know we, we have these uh, these dot files uh, for static and shared that transitively find uh, reds and maybe halide helpers uh, in the in the static case because again the static case depends on on components of the halide runtime. So uh, it's that simple. Uh, I, I hope that like, kind of hearing me uh, chat about this. Um, has given you a bit of an insight into what goes into like writing a like production quality uh, CMake build, and I really do hope that the example project that I um, that I wrote for for all you guys, uh, you know, is useful and a, and a good model or a starting point to, to do this work yourself. And of course, you can you can reach out to me um, and ask me questions. I, I I am absolutely a build systems enthusiast, so I. I have spent so I've spent so much time struggling with uh, build systems that don't make my life as a downstream easy, but I, I'm very motivated to, to make things better for everybody. So yeah, I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, mercifully, uh, actually using this build in, in the in, in the runner application is really straightforward. So this is it. Um, I'm just going to find the SDL2 package. I'm going to find the diffuse package. Uh, 
and I'm going to link and I'm going to link them to my diffuse executable, which just has the main .cpp file. Uh, of course, uh, SDL2 um, <laughs> doesn't work like you would want. Um, when you link the main object file, that is completely independent of SDL2 of like the main SDL2 library. So you need to specify both of them, and you need to specify them in this order. Not what I not what I would have hoped from SDL2, but hopefully with SDL3, this is fixed. I, I haven't actually tried it. Um, and then I also say that I want to compile with a C++17, and this is the way to do it these days is with this target compiled, which is a thing. And then uh, if I'm building with mscripten, I copy the uh, the index.html file out to um, uh, out to the build directory for convenience. Um, and then there's just this one last little thing that I put in here for Windows systems. So uh, the, the CMake import library suffix uh, variable is defined if and only if you're on a, a, on a DLL system. Um, and in this case, you're going to want to put the, uh, the your DLL dependencies next to your executables. And so this custom command will, after uh, the fuse is the, the, the fuse runner, the, the SDL runner is, is built, will copy all of its dependent uh, DLLs next to it. Um, and this particular command only works as it's 3.26, the latest version, um, because uh, I found a I found a bug where when target runtime DLLs was empty, the cmake copy command would have an invalid uh, syntax. And so you're left with this. So uh, I am unfortunately out of uh, time for demos if we're going to do any amount of Q&A. Um, I, I thought this talk was going to, was going to go a little bit more briskly, but wow. Uh, yeah, this was, this was fun. Uh, I would love to take questions in, in, in chat, uh, but I think I will very quickly just kind of show that, that this does run. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you have time, don't worry. It's just, okay. Yeah, take your time. Take your yeah, time. yeah let, me, um, let me switch my share. Uh, I'm just going to do the whole screen. That'll make life simpler. Okay, so I'm just going to do the uh, the mscript and build. So I have this little script here that's in the repository called test uh, mscripten.sh. And the way that it works is it has to go in three phases. So first it has to build the halide generators for diffuse because those have to run in the host system. And so the add halide generator uh, function uh, creates this target called project name dash halide generators that just builds the generators. So that's what's going to happen here. You know, we're uh, we're building uh, with Ninja for release. Uh, here I'm creating a host build directory and I'm just building the generators. So now I'm going to switch to the mscripten toolchain. So I'm just setting this uh, the CMake toolchain file by asking uh, the mscripten configuration tool where the where the uh, toolchain file is located. And now down here, I'm just going to point. Um, I'm going to point the build to those uh, halide generators in the host build directory, and I'm going to set the halide target to uh, WebAssembly with SIMD and threads. And then I need to override the unhelpful uh, mscripten toolchain setting to allow me to find the, uh, those host components. So that happens down here. And so once I've built Diffuse uh, for mscripten, now I can build the uh, FDL app. Uh, I, I point it to uh, the location of the Diffuse library, and then again, um, I needed to I needed to allow me to actually find things. Uh, this this is very frustrating on mscripten's part uh, here. So I'm just going to run this script, test, test mscripten, and it should just uh, run into each of these things. So yeah, right now it's building the halide generators to the host. Forgot how slow this laptop is. <laughs> Really only taking one of these two. Yeah, there it goes building the halide generators. Great. Now it's going to build uh, the whole thing for Unscripten. There we go. Now it's built it for Unscripten and, uh, and uh, install the package into a local directory. And now it's going to build uh, the SDL runner app. There we are. And I can just run uh, Python 3, it's, it's HTTP server, in the uh, build directory for the SDL app. And I can run it in localhost here. And you can see that indeed the build works. That's, that's a real trip on Zoom with the, the low frame rate. It's, uh, it's a lot smoother for me. <laughs> 
but yeah, um, there you go. And the, and the code is really uh, as simple as I showed on the slides. Uh, you, you can get to this point of uh, cross compiling with, you know, host running code generators uh, without tearing your hair out. That's the that's the real upshot of what, of what I'm trying to say here. Is just like just declare what needs to be where. Keep your CMake lists to the sort of bare bones. Like this is what must be so, and you can and you'll have a build that's ultimately very flexible. Uh, there, there's really nothing uh, special about MScript in here. I could just as well have built this for like. You know, risk five or free BSD or something else. It's like a little, little strange, but, but yeah, uh, I think that that concludes uh, my talk. So yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Alex. Uh, yeah. Question: Do, do we uh, we have time for questions? I, I have plenty of time. I, I, right. I, I won't be offended, of course, if anybody drops. I know this thing is only supposed to be an hour, um, but yeah, so, I'm very happy. To so I'll I'll see if anyone I have few but I'll I'll let others start. So I have a basic question. So if it was already covered, uh, uh, sorry I joined late. Uh, like how do I include uh, like if I want to do the cross compilation for another target? Like uh, how do I do that using CMake? Want to, if you want to do which part? Cross compile uh, to say like uh, ARM GCC or uh, something else from Windows. Right. So it, so in this case, you're just setting the, the tool chain file. And the tool chain file it has, um, it, it will set the variables like CMXCFX compiler, CMXC compiler, and, and so on in order to um, in order to compile for the desired target. So like the hexagon SDK has a tool chain file for hexagon. The mscripten SDK has a tool chain file for mscripten. Um, um, and there's a bunch of sort of uh, in the documentation you can see how to do it for like using MSVC uh, for ARM64 or something. All, all of the, there, this is all on the CMake Dash tool chains uh, documentation module. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thanks. So, um, if you have a really complicated build that has you know many dependencies and you want to use a cloud and spread the work out a lot, you know, do do you talk about like build dependencies across? Libraries, um, like how do you see that? So I, I see the CMake lists as basically describing one unit of compilation. Uh, should, the idea is that uh, a CMake list file, or rather one single CMake build, uh, only has support for one, um, basically for ex for exactly one tool chain. And so if you need to, uh, if you have a very large and very complicated build with you know lots of lots of moving parts, then those are sort of sort of the, the boundaries at which you do these things. Um, but basically, the the divide between uh, packages uh, that I see as being sort of most fruitful is uh, first party, third party, or perhaps like shared, not shared, um, where for uh, other people's builds uh, that are you know sort of not offered by you, those are the th those things should be encapsulated and then brought into your build via via fine package. Uh, and at this point, I would say that even if you do want to include them all in like one large uh, CMake generated ninja file, they should still be um, they should still be added to your build via fine package. And then the new CMake dependency providers feature can be used to uh, override those uh, relatively simply override those fine packages with like add subdirectories or go and fetch this from my binary cache and put it somewhere uh, sort of things. Um, this is basically a, a layer uh, that sits uh, on top or sort of ahead of a CMake build. Uh, and of course, like you can always just set uh, C cache however you want to. I, I found that pretty effective. Uh, the, the CMake C and CXX compiler wrapper feature can be used to do like just CC or ice cream or, or uh, C cache builds uh, completely independently of anything else that I've said. So uh, thanks, Alex, again for the uh, great talk. I, I I must admit that every time I I think that I know enough on CMake, someone like you comes in and and shake up my uh, self confidence. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I I know you touched uh, you touched uh, on on it a bit, but uh, just a few more seconds. Like if you need to wait uh, or kind of rank the. Uh, the, the best uh, uh, how to consume a project 
an outside project. So they are, you're talking about fine packaging, but, but fetch content, there, there, is, there is a package manager. How would you rate, like what, what's the first thing that we need to uh, reach out to? Uh, like what, what, how do you rank them? So, so I, I, I tend to like VC package. Um, the, I have not, so I expect to enjoy Conan 2. I haven't used it. Um, but the way that it works now is very much like the way the VC package does in that you just give it a CMake toolchain file and it overrides all of your fine packages to go to its directories, which is exactly how it ought to work. Uh, the older versions of uh, Conan would uh, build using the upstream CMake build systems or make or whatever they were, and then it would generate new uh, CMake uh, files that had like Conan and the imported target names. And so it wound up coupling your project to the package manager, which is something that I didn't like at all. Um, that, was, that was not a design that I, that I appreciated. Uh, yeah, I, basically, I, I basically wanted my package manager to do what I would do by hand in a much more automated fashion and for lots and lots of uh, dependencies that I don't, that I don't need to track down. So that's what, that's what attracted me to VC package. And when I start uh, playing with Conan 2, I think I'll like it too. Uh, but yeah, uh, using a real package manager has never been easier uh, for, for C and C++ these days. Um, and uh, as long as you keep going through just this fine package uh, interface in your cmakelists.txt, your users will be able to switch between VC package or Conan or your you know distro provided package manager or when that becomes a, a more prominent thing or anything along those lines. That's, that's kind of the point. Is that it's the it's the most overridable, the most hookable uh, entry point into um, like third party CMake code. Yeah, and, and people likes uh, fetch content, but it sounds sounds like it's uh, so uh, so it, ha it has its own cons, right? Uh, there are some issues with that. But yeah, so can you can you just uh, quickly summarize what do you think is is the issue with with that? Project encapsulation. The, the the issue is that lots of uh, lots of upstream CMake projects, in my experience, are very like flag happy. They're they're gonna sniff around uh, your system to see what it, what they think they can uh, attach to uh, the, the targets. And if they end up setting like the CMake CXX flags cache variable, that can pollute your build. Um, yeah. Yeah, and nice. they can do all kinds of other weird things too. They can, uh, yeah, setting cache variables is definitely the most common uh, method of poisoning your stuff. But it can also just be like, yeah, your upstream is gonna um, set W error unconditionally, and now your project can't update its compiler uh, because the newer compiler has new warnings. Uh, something that I think people don't really uh, think about or understand really is that the exact semantics of a warning flag are uh, kind of agreed upon by the develop like by basically the developer community, uh, the people who work on the compiler, and the people who are submitting bug reports, uh, and so the exact meaning of each flag is dependent on the I would say the build of the compiler. Yeah. There are yeah, but the particular patch version maybe, and and so moving between these things, you'll you'll find that uh, you know. The, the, the warning flag can be more or less sensitive depending on depending on the version. And if you have W error set, it's just a nightmare. This is something that, that bites me as uh, it's like when I'm helping people with this type of stuff all the time. Um, w error is absolutely great. I think everybody should be using it in CI. Uh, you shouldn't be checking in code that you know has warnings, all of that. But it's, but that's a completely different thing than putting it in your cmakelist.txt, which communicates that it's a hard build requirement for your code being able to compile. It's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That, and yeah. and since since you talked about warnings, you mentioned presets, which which was always on my to-do to kind of integrate into, into yeah. the project. Uh, so does it work with, me with, a, with, a, with a big tree, big project with some modules that the very heterogeneous uh, requirements uh, some needs this flag some needs the other flags so how presets actually uh, address this kind of uh, requirement um I, I well no more or less well than uh than i guess cma currently does because when you have these like, very heterogeneous things you end up having to build them separately anyway so what i would imagine um what i would imagine happening in those cases is you use the presets for your own build to manage uh lists of settings but then you're still doing for your 
for your upstreams that have to be built separately, sort of whatever whatever they do. This is just a way of managing uh, lists of configurations for your for your project, not for not for other ones that are at this like CMake configure like, encapsulation boundary. I see. So, so if it's if it's a if it's a sub model, they might have their own presets. Right, and you could yeah. use that, and you could use those if one's suitable, or you could uh, or you could use one and progressively enhance it. Because a preset just gives a baseline. So when you do like CMake dash dash preset whatever, you're still free to specify cache variables that override the preset. So you can get to like you know 95% of the way there, right? You know they, some upstream might provide a, a preset that's almost exactly what you need, but then you just like update the the prefix path or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When when you really do have these like very complicated graphs, uh, what I sometimes like to do is create a um, like a directory called like CMake slash super builds. And then I have like a CMake list.txt that has a bunch of ex, um, external project calls in there that can orchestrate a full uh, graph of, of builds for like one, again, one particular uh, configuration space. Because yes. at that point, you have the ability to start, start changing things. But, um, but again, without, uh, without first party or rather first class uh, project encapsulation in CMake, there's really no other way to do it because you would, because if you want to set the CXX flags for one project to be one thing, but then something else for another project, there's you just there's no way of doing it. I mean, you can there are there are ways to do it that are at least as high effort. That's what I'll say. You would have to like hook variable watch or write a bunch of little scripts and use like the pro, and use like the project command uh, code injection feature or something like that. Which I mean, at that point, just use external uh, external project because it's easier to understand. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Are there any other uh, questions? Hello. Thank you so much. I know you touched on this, but what's the alternative to glob configure depends when a directory has like fifty C plus plus files. List them in Halide. We have almost two hundred. You can, if, if the if it makes it hard to read, uh, one um, one approach that might work is you create a separate uh, file called like sources.cmake, um, and you can just like sort of ls start of cpp start of h and, and paste it into there. You can do like a file read kind of thing. But the um, but the, but the point is that you, in order for your generated build system to know when to regenerate the CMake, basically to know when to regenerate itself. It has to know when the list of sources changed and configure depends doesn't always work. It only works for, it really only works for the latest version of Ninja. It was bugged before then on Windows. Um, mostly works with make files. It's just not a thing on Visual Studio last I checked and I don't think it's a thing on Xcode either. So the, yeah, it's one of these things where, you know, if you choose to go the glob configure depends route, I would say you should do the same thing uh, for like uh, fetch content, where you basically say, uh, I'm going to check the ninja version, I'm going to check the CMake generator. If it's not one of the approved combinations, I'm just not going to let you build. Uh, you can, if you want to, if you want to draw like the line in the sand like that, that's that's one way of doing it. Um, but I, I I just don't see the like long lists of sources thing as as a, as a real problem because. Generally, if it's very long, you don't have to write it by hand. You can just write like a one-liner uh, in Bash and call it a day. And it's not like you're constantly adding 50 source files at a time. You're bootstrapping this once. You know, incrementally, you'll maybe add one or delete one or change a file name every so often. But I mean, as a, in my experience as like a Halide maintainer, I think we add files once every hundred pull requests. It, it, almost always, it's some, changing some exist, existing behavior. Thank you so much. Sure. By the way, do you list do you list headers as well? What's that? Do you list headers as well, or just uh, just? Uh, I do list headers. And the you reason, do list the headers. To, yeah. The reason to list headers, um, first of all, with the file sets feature is because it gives you automatic install. It, it gives you the installation stuff for free. Uh, but even for the private headers, um, when uh, when tools like VS Code or Visual Studio uh, try to load your project. They use that. They use those lists of headers when sort of organizing the project uh, panes. Um, so if you exclude the headers, they're not listed. Mm. Uh, it's just a bad. And that's also a bad user experience. So yeah, yeah. you, you list Good. both. Good. Mm -hmm. I listed, but uh, 
but it's good to know it's a, it's a, it's a, it, there's a good, uh, good reasoning behind it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not just cargo culting. It's, it's a real thing. Okay. Thanks. Any, anyone else? Yeah, I have a um, sort of a kind of one and wait to all after more relevant questions. Um, I've never heard of needing to patch a uh, binary after it was built for the purposes of, of packaging. Um, ah. Could you give a sense of like when that, the sort of scenario where that happens? Um, so the so CMake does it always when doing install stuff. Um, it it, uh, it edits the R path um, on, on Linux systems to uh, be whatever your install R path is. Uh, and sometimes okay. CMake projects will hard code the install R path to something inappropriate, which then means either the um, either the build system has to be edited or the binaries have to be patched on the other side. Uh, and so um, this, this is maybe less relevant for C, like the C make and R path combination, but it's definitely something that happens with like auto tools and make files uh, where the R path gets set to something that you can't override. And then it's just easier to, to run um, to run like a patch off kind of a command. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Alex, before we, we let you go? It was wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I um, it took a little longer than I was expecting to. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Response. That's fine. When I say, <laughs> yeah, when I say in one hour, it's just, uh, just a, just a framing. Sure. Um, we sometimes yeah. have two hours even. That's, that's yeah. why I don't, don't reward. Um, uh, I saw that somebody posted a link to my blog post in the uh, chat, which is great because that link also has all my contact info. If you, any of you want to reach out with uh, more questions about uh, CMake stuff. Awesome, so, thank you. <laughs> and, and this would be this would be uh, all over the uh, uh, social networks like LinkedIn and, and, yeah, and Twitter and all. <laughs> yeah. so Thanks, so Alex. There's so much more that I, that, I could, that I could have covered, but yeah, so a lot of stuff had to be cut and yeah, there's just so much more to say. It's a huge topic. CMake is yeah, huge, yeah. it's huge. <laughs> If, well, if you can't speak about them now, what would you want to talk about in the future? Um, I would probably want to talk about, uh, but um, compile like, like vectorization type stuff, where you need to s sort of see what um, what target it is that you're that you're compiling for, and that becomes a, an actual build requirement. So you know, if you have uh, like multiple implementations of optimized kernels, like for um, for ARM and for x86. And there's also a lot more to talk about in the, in the, in the cross compilation space too for, for code generators and the like. Uh, the Halide um, helpers do a lot of that work for you and I it would, be, it would have been a lot of fun to cover their implementation, but again, the, that would have taken maybe another half an hour. <laughs> no, no, it's great, thanks. I, I just kind of, you know, like you give me a lot of things to go study now. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. Same here, lots of homework for me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, sure. everyone, for joining me. See you next uh, month. Take care. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much for Thank hosting you me. So much. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Thanks.